So there's a lot of different materials out there as supplementary cementitious materials. We've, we've been using fly ash for years, slag, and now there's a bunch of interest in new uh, natural pozzolans, ground bottom ash, which I'll be talking about, and of course, ground glass, in addition to metacillin and silica fumes. So one of the things that's driving this thing for bottom ash is the reduction in coal power. Uh, certainly in Alberta, which I've highlighted here on the upper right province in Canada, they have the most coal power plants in Canada. Uh, the other ones are shown with the little, the, the blue dots are coal power plants. So there's only about three provinces with coal power plants and they're, they're gonna be gone within the next three years. I'm gonna stop touching my mouse here. Okay, and this just shows, the reduct this was in 2019, the schedule for phasing out the existing coal plants, a couple are getting converted to gas. And by the end of 23, the plan was to have them all shut, all those coal power plants in Alberta, and that'll be the end of them. Now, since then, things have accelerated. Uh, they're actually going to be closed probably at the end of 22 now. And Saskatchewan next door, the province to the right that has other coal plants, is also shutting down plants. And so we had a problem because in Western Canada, the only SEM they had available was fly ash. Um, to, uh, and they have alkali aggregate problems. They've got severe sulfate exposure problems. And of course, with uh, de-icer salts, they've got chloride exposure problems. Without flash, they can't make concrete that meets the Canadian standard for concretes in that environment. They couldn't mitigate ASR, they couldn't mitigate sulfate attack, and they wouldn't meet the Coulomb limits we have in our standard for chloride attack. So we undertook a study on behalf of the industry, Mike Thomas and I, last year, and we looked at all the literature data, and I'll show a tiny bit of it uh, today, on using beneficiated ash. Now in Canada, none of the, almost none of the fly ash or landfill uh, ash deposits are, are just fly ash. They're typically co-mingled with bottom ash. Um, I think it's different than a lot of states in the US, but in Canada, they're generally co-mingled. So we had an issue here that if people wanna beneficiate fly ash to uh, make use of that, to replace the coal ash that will no longer be produced, we have to deal with this co-mingled ash. So we looked at that issue as well. And then the, um, uh, we actually wrote a report which was presented to the Canadian Standards Committee. And as a result, we've amended the Canadian standard just about a month ago to allow the use of beneficiated harvested ash, even if it's co-mingled with bottom ash and just call it fly ash, either class F or class C based on its chemistry. So that we've solved our problem, at least for now. Uh, and there's plants actually starting to, to produce. They've set up facilities to, to beneficiate the ash in Alberta. So we've been filling the, you know, we're looking at filling the gap with um, reclaimed coal ash from landfills and lagoons. There is a reemergence of natural pozzolans, although not so much in Canada. Other than one metacalin source, there's nothing much in Canada that's being uh, mined at this, or beneficiated at this point. Um, the ground glass pozzolans have come on as a new standard for ground glass pozzolans, but again, that's not been a, a, a done, done anything in Canada except out in Quebec. Um, and of course, there's other issues. People are trying to use calcine clay limestone mixtures, this LC3 concept that's been pushed by EPFL and Karen Scrivener's group. So um, there are alternatives, but we've got to do something now in a big way for the concrete industry. This is just a, a graph showing the um, fly ash production in the United States from 1966 to 2013. And it shows the production and the use. And then the red line is the percentage of its use with the right-hand uh, axis. So it's been climbing. The, the percent of the ash that is produced being used is, is climbing. You can see the production's gone down since around 2004 or five. And the difference between what's produced and what's used is what's in the ground. And there's approximately a billion tons there, and this only goes to 2013. So there's a huge resource there of material that could be excavated and used um, and beneficiated for use in concrete. Now, there's a lot of literature on this. So these are just listing some of the literature that we reviewed in our study um, on the use of 
fly ash, uh, harvested ash, bottom ash, and commingled ash. And there's a picture of Mike uh, excavating an ash deposit out in New Brunswick. Um, like I said, t sometimes it's stored, monoflash is stored as a monofill, but in most cases, at least in Canada, they're commingled with bottom ash, either in lagoons or landfills. Now, coal ash and bottom ash come from the same furnace, from the same coal, so they'd be, they're similar in chemical composition. So the big question is how reactive are they? Unground bottom ash particles are typically coarser because they fall to the bottom of the furnace as opposed to flying off in the gas stream. And so we've got two options here, either separating the flash and bottom ash either by particle size or grinding the commingled ash to bring it down to the fineness of fly ash. And so this is a um, typical plant which shows there's the furnace in orange there and the fly ash gets carried away in the, in the gas stream. And the bottom ash falls out of the bottom as bigger particles and you can see they're not spherical because they, they didn't, um, they were bigger particles. They didn't uh, fly off into the gas from the liquid so they didn't form nice spherical particles. They fall into the bottom and they're typically much coarser. And so there's a picture, a micrograph of the left but you see the sample that's it's more like the sand, very fine sand size, whereas the fly ash on the right isn't. So you see the diff big difference in particle size of the raw, um, about a factor of 10 larger in the bottom ash mean particle diameter. But we can mill that ash. If you take the bottom ash and mill it on the right, it looks a lot like fly ash and it just shows in the particle size distribution. You can get the same particle size distribution from ground fly ash ground bottom ash as you can with fly ash from the same source. And again, the chemistries are almost identical. And so, and here's some examples from Ivan Diaz's, uh, one of his papers, showing the difference at a, at a given source is a, a ash on the left, the difference in chemical composition between fly ash and bottom ash, they're almost identical. Um, and the same with the sea ash on the right. So chemically, they're, they're pretty much identical. So there shouldn't be an issue there. One issue that's been raised, and again, this is some of Ivan's data, is, is the glass content the same? Since we want the amorphous aluminosilicates to, to provide the reactivity as a pozzolan, and it shows in this example that the bottom ash has a lower glass content, or amorphous content, um, because it probably cooled slow, more slowly than the fly ash. And so, but the number of papers shown, if you take raw fly uh, bottom ash, which is shown on the particle size on the right, uh, here on the right, and you grind it down to the same particle size as fly ash, and you make 50 millimeter two inch cubes, you can get really good compressive strengths. And so you can see the compressive strength uh, coming up with the bottom ash. The bottom ashes are shown in red, the first four bars of the bottom ash compared to the flash. If you grind the bottom ash enough, you can get the same compressive strength um, as, the, uh, um, as the fly ash from the same source. Here's some other work, again, showing fly ash, um, one, two, three, four, with an average particle size of 14.7 microns, and it shows the strength activities at 7, 28, 90 days. And you've got bottom ash ground to two different finenesses here. You can see as you grind it finer, you get higher strength activity uh, at all ages. And this graph shows uh, chloride migration, chloride resistance, my, uh, chloride migration values using the MT492 test. And uh, the dark green shows ground bottom ash having very good 20% or 25% at very good values, 10% is the blue, dark blue there, uh, compared to SAM1. And it shows the same levels of fly ash. In this case, the 10% bottom ash performed better than the 10% fly ash, and same at 25% of this particular source. And you can see the chloride profiles, the ground bottom ash had much uh, better resistance to chloride penetration. Similar uh, trend with resistivity at bulk resistivity measurements, if you like that better than migration. Some ASR data with fly ash and ground bottom ash and it just shows 
This is a rapid mortar bar test that if you have fly ash and bottom ash, two different finenesses from the same source, you get essentially the same sort of reduction uh, mm -hmm. in ASR expansion at very similar levels. It's not identical, but it's very close within a few percent. Now, as a result of the Canadian, the change that allowed this year, one of the Canadian plants has already set up a facility to beneficiate fly ash, or well, ash. It's actually a 60% fly ash, 40% bottom ash blend. They've done ASR testing, they've got sulfate testing in progress, but this is a standard sort of 618 uh, report on it. And it shows that they've got very fine material that a lot less, 14% retain, retain on a 45 micron or 325. The strength activity is good at both seven and 28 days. The water requirement's fine. Um, there's no soundness issue. And it meets all the, some of the oxides requirements. And there's nothing, no issue with sulfate, excess sulfate. Okay, now I'll move on to the second part of the study, the work that mahipal has been doing for his PhD part of it, and he'll be presenting other work later, is on a modified lime pozzolan test to evaluate materials such as ground bottom ash, because we know that the current ASTM uh, 311 test uh, for strength activity is not great for differentiating reactivity of materials. Um, and so in this case, what they, did, they took a it's in the Canadian standard, a lime pozzolan test. It's actually in the Indian standard as well. It was an ancient, removed in the 1980s from ASTM because it, people didn't think it was that good. But we've modified the test method here. So you've got different ratio of calcium hydroxide to pozzolan here. Um, small amount of calcite in there. Sand to a, a binder ratio. Water binder ratio is fixed as opposed to a constant flow. And what makes this test work is the mixed alkali solution. Alkali hydroxide alkali sulfate, which raises the pH. And that's really important because the pH is really uh, the solubility of glassy silica in the fly ash is very dependent on pH. If you have crystalline silica like quartz, it's, it doesn't matter what the pH is at normal temperatures, you're not gonna get much soluble silica out of it. But you can see here, like a lime solution, a standard lime solution, if you only put calcium hydroxide in, you're at about 12.4. And you can see on the solubility curve that between 12 and 13, it takes off like a rocket. And concrete is way over off the graph here. It's between 13 and 14, depending on the alkali content of the cement you're using. So to get a realistic test, we need to raise the pH level or hydroxylion level in the solution to actually make the, the fly ash react. And these tests are done at 40 degrees C or, or 100 degree F. And this just shows some seven day mortar strengths. And the ground bottom ash is shown in red, uh, on the, as indicated there. Some flashes are shown in blue there. We've got some inert materials in there and some very reactive metakill and silica fume and things on the right. We can see the ground bottom ash is giving good seven day strengths. And we compared it to the, the eight, ASTM 1876 bound water test that came in last year, the so-called R3 test. And you get a good re uh, relationship. Um, and again, we, they did some work with the raw bottom ash and grinding it down to um, fly ash sizes here. And so some of the graphs will show the raw ash versus the ground bottom ash. And so here's um, strength at 7, 28, and 91 days. Uh, and that's uh, concrete now, concrete made with the materials. And you can see that it develops strength, increasing strength at three ages, and it's reaching the same, the control is the Portland cement over here on the left-hand side. And you can see that by 28 days, it's reached the same strength and at 90 days it's exceeded the strength of the Portland cement control. And the Coulomb values again are going down with age and they're lower than the Portland cement control at all ages, even at seven days. Now if you compare the lime pozzolan test that we we're just talking about to this bound water test that's the, in the new standard, you can see that the, the inert materials, which would include the, the, B, the unground bottom ash, BA, are very low bound water, very low strength. The ground bottom ash has very high strength and high bound water. So it, it shows the impact of grinding the material. And this is the 90-day concrete strength versus the seven-day lime pozzolan test. And again, shows that um, good relationship. Again, there's the, um, the inert materials versus the 
but doesn't show the you know, bottom mesh. ASR testing uh, using the borosilicate glass or Pyrex glass test, ASTM441, shows the reduction you get from the ground bottom ash, which is that bottom line there. Even the unground bottom ash did fairly well, but the ground bottom ash, there's actually no expansion after almost six months here in this test, whereas the control's gone um, much higher. And in sulfate resistance, the ASTM1012 test, ground bottom ash is performing very well whereas the unground bottom mesh, of course, didn't because it's so coarse, it's not reacting. Again, this is the um, bulk resistance, sorry, the 90-day um, non-steady state migration test using the NT492 test on the top and bulk resistivity on the bottom. And this, the bottom mesh and the ground bottom mesh are shown there. So you get much better, you know, once you grind the bottom mesh, it's as good as the fly ashes over here on the left, and the, res and the bulk resistivity is equal to or better than the fly ashes as well at the same replacement level. And this just shows that the ones with good seven day lime pozzolan values have low charge passed in the Coulomb test, the uh, CPSTM 1202. So the reactive materials, including the ground bottom mesh, have low Coulombs and high strength in the seven day test. And the same with the ground, um, with the chloride migration, the 492 test. Showing when it's ground, we get um, good values at the, um, when you get sufficient material in there. And the same with resistivity. And the ground bottom ash is shown here again. Higher resistivity relates to better strength in the my test and then the night and um, both cases here. Okay, the, this is the mortar bar test, the, sorry, the, the Pyrex mortar bar test showing the uh, ground bottom mesh again, very low, zero expansion, and it relates to the higher strength in this uh, proposed test method. Um, and again, the ground bottom mesh performed well in the 15 months in ASTMC 1202. Very little expansion next to zero. So, and just as a point of interest, the use of bottom ash is not new. It was a patent filed in the United States in 1998 on the use of fly ash, a bottom ash in concrete. I'm not sure how much it was ever utilized, but it was that's 23 years ago. So people recognize that it had potential. So, in conclusion. The ground bottom ash, when it's ground up, has good pozzolanic properties. When it's ground to sufficient fineness, it's similar in terms of its benefits regarding the performance as fly ash at the same replacement level. This modified lime pozzolan test, seven day lime pozzolan test, is a reliable indicator of performance with regard to strength, resistivity, and chloride resistance, and other properties. And electrical resistivity of these mortars provides a good indicator of performance in concrete. All the pozzolanic activities uh, increase resistivity, but not all pozzolanic materials increase durability with regards to ASR and sulfate. And that's another indicator of whether something's doing something useful or not. So that's the end of this talk. So thank you very much for your time.